So I was volunteered to uh, present the information for the Middle Port John Day IMW, not because I know everything that's going on in the Middle Port John Day, um, but I have been involved from the beginning, um, essentially. I remember sitting down at the table with Greg Sieglitz and others and trying to determine where we would place an IMW in the John Day. And there was already a great working group uh, there. So we decided to uh, build on the information that was already available. And there was already time series information available for fish in the basin, um, thanks to BPA funding. So we took advantage of all of that in order to uh, initiate um, some, a new one, some new work um, within the middle fork. And um, I'm, today's presentation is gonna be a very broad overview, and I'm just gonna touch on some highlights because there's been a, a wide variety of things that have been monitored, and um, you know, it's 10 years plus of information. We have an annual report, a summary report um, that's available. And this is just a summary. There's 12 appendices that go with it as well. So uh, there's a lot of information out there that can provide the detail you might be looking for. So I mentioned I'm just going to give a brief overview today. Um, some of the reasoning why we picked the Middle Fork IMW, why it was a good place to start some work. Very few highlights of the work we're going to do there, and because I'm a fish biologist, it's going to be somewhat fish-centric, um, but I'm going to touch on some of the work that some of the other researchers have been doing in the basin. Um, I'm going to focus on some of the model conclusions. There's been some models developed in, in uh, uh, not parameterized necessarily, but um, have some finishing touches that have been used in the in the middle fork, and then finish up with some lessons learned um, from a lot of the work, both from the uh, monitoring folks and from the implementers. And just an overview of the watershed. Um, this is a semi-arid area. You saw some pictures of the nearby watersheds of the Soton and Bridge Creek. Um, the Middle Fork John Day is a little higher elevation than those has, and gets a little more um, precipitation. A fair amount of that precipitation is in snow melt, but it's not real high elevation, so that snow doesn't last um, well into the summer. So um, discharge in the basin does go down significantly in June and July. And the IMW itself is the green portion here in the upper end of the of Middle Fork watershed. Not sure how I did that. So, the um, one of the main reasons why we picked the Middle Fork here is that we had some good in, um, long-term information on fish. This is uh, Chinook um, productivity, freshwater productivity um, from the basin. The Middle Fork shown in blue and um, a reference basin in the nearby Upper John Day shown in red. Um, just showing the smallest produced um, for the uh, metric of adults in reds counted and some standard Ricker stock recruitment curves. Um, two things to notice there, the middle fork seems to be uh, much less productive than a nearby stream that has a similar discharge and it also has, seems to have a very, very much a feeling where there's not a lot of extra productivity occurring, even though you can stick in a bunch of extra adults. Um, it doesn't seem to matter how many fish you put in beyond about 250, you still get the same results in the number of smolts being produced out of the system. So perhaps habitat is limiting productivity. So some of the restoration actions that have occurred in, in the watershed. Um, this isn't a, a standard uh, backy type design um, IMW where one big impact came in at one time. It's more of a real life picture of restoration actions occurring in a watershed 
and we're trying to determine whether or not those are having an impact on, on the uh, response variables we're picking. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work done on a number of different um, types of restoration actions. There's been some a fair amount of fencing in the basin um, and some responses from that. There's been some passive restoration where basically cattle have been excluded from um, pastures and we have seen some big responses there in some of the vegetation. This one's showing a, a big response um, from a different um, before and after when cattle were excluded and this vegetation here is primarily um, carex nidata or torrent sedge, a uh, um, type of sedge that actually has a lot of influence on the, on the morphology of the streams um, in this area. Another big uh, restoration action that has occurred is wood placement. Um, much of the middle fork uh, main channel has had some large areas where wood has been placed um, and tributaries have also um, received a fair amount of wood as well. This is um, one of the tributaries, Camp Creek, and this is the main stem, um, John Day there and there as well. Probably the um, most dramatic restoration actions that have occurred on the main stem Middle Fork John Day are the large um, channel reconstruction projects that have occurred on properties that uh, BPA paid for um, several years ago and are owned by the Warm Springs um, tribe these days. And that's where a lot of the um, active restoration has occurred on the main stem. So lots of different restoration actions occurring. Just a map showing where some of those actions have occurred. And the big actions that I just showed you have occurred primarily here on the main stem reaches where channel reconstruction occurred um, on the Oxbow property as well as some properties below that. And that's a lot of the locations where a lot of that large wood has been placed. So for some of the monitoring activities that have occurred um, since the, um, in the beginning in 2008, essentially, um, ODFW is in charge of the fish production, all the fish in, fish out monitoring of both um, Chinook salmon and steelhead in the basin. Uh, temperature has been monitored at a number of different scales um, with uh, infrared technology, you know, plenty of thermistors being place throughout the basin, um, uh, distributed temperature sensing or DTS with fiber optic cables that have been used at a very small scale to look at small scale changes in temperature in the stream channel. Um, invertebrates have been monitored. I'm not going to present any results from those um, today. We've had a socioeconomic impact study conducted based on the actions that have occurred primarily from the restoration in the basin. Um, habitat has been monitored by a number of different groups, University of Oregon, um, Pat McDowell's group, and um, U.S. Forest Service has monitored um, the habitat at the watershed scale as well. OSU has monitored groundwater in the basin, and um, a number of models have been developed. Uh, and and uh, refined in the basin. The heat source model looking at temperature and a life cycle model for steel has been developed in collaboration with the ISM group. So for some of the results, um, I'll provide some information um, on salmon and steelhead where I'm most comfortable talking about fish. I'll uh, present some information on the Geomorphic response we saw from a large flood event in 2011 and how the channel um, responded to that. Uh, look at some temperature predictions from the heat source model um, and as well as some uh, implications for riparian management and then 
um, a little bit of follow up with some lessons learned perhaps from the life cycle model. So we monitored steelhead and chinook at the population scale and we essentially did not see a population scale productivity response or a numerical response um, as for either of those species, when it's, especially when it's compared to our control watershed. And we used this, the South Fork John Day as our control. I don't necessarily see that as a negative. Uh, it actually refined where we should be looking and um, it, we're looking towards the future and we're using this information to refine what actions we should be doing um, in response to this so-called negative um, result that uh, we received in, in the watershed. So why did we see a negative result or no response? Um, we think there's two main factors affecting fish in the basin. Obviously fish need water. You add more water, you get more fish typically. Um, this is a, a system that has is, is on the low end of discharge really for a Chinook population. So it, it's not too surprising that flows are influencing fish numbers, especially um, during July and August during summer months. Not so much in September. And why we would be seeing that um, is likely resulting because of temperature influences are less in September than they would be in July and August. This is information for uh, uh, a Barker mark recapture result that um, Kirk has done for us in the, in the middle fork, looking at the um, survival, the four month survival of steelhead as a function of temperature. Obviously when temperature is increasing towards the thermal maxima, there, um, our results align with the literature and show uh, decreasing survival. So some of the geomorphology results that um, Pat McDowell's group has looked at and has shown uh, influences of a, of a flood event in 2011 um, and some of the response of the channel and um, aggradation and degradation with those large wood placements. This is essentially showing some of the control um, reaches that she um, has established and then some of the treatment reaches where some of the wood has been placed. There was a positive response in residual pool depth after that large um, flood event and also uh, a, a positive negative response in the percent embeddedness of, of the substrates um, in, in the channels as well. I mentioned the heat source model, um, a mechanistic model of phys for physical habitat to predict um, water temperature responses. And this is some modeling results showing the, in the influence of several um, influence, mostly um, influences from uh, vegetation. Each one of these trajectories um, suggests a different vegetation response. But the bandwidth here it also indicates um, fluctuations in both discharge and, it, and future temperature prediction. Basically, the mature forest um, simulation suggests that that would be the best benefit for reducing temperatures in, in the watershed. And the black line is our base value. Um, working with um, on vegetation, um, they've looked at uh, ungulate browsing in the basin as well, and um, it's not a big surprise that uh, deer and elk are eating some of the vegetation that's out there. Um, certainly, if you're going to pick some vegetation to restore, and you, if you're not going to fence it, you're not going to want to pick cottonwood and aspen because deer and elk love cottonwood and aspen. So um, we saw a good. Uh, before and after uh, results from mountain alder and um, some of the other species. So those are the ones that are actually doing some um, regrowth in the watershed and providing some shade um, for the stream channel. And then now for uh, moving into the um, 
life cycle model, and I'm going to have to um, fly through this. This is a, a, a model built with information based on Middle Fork. It was in collaboration with the ISM group. Pete McHugh and Carl Sanders, Saunders were the main um, pushers um, for the model. It essentially um, takes field survey data, um, combines it with fish habitat models, hydraulic models, and um, it uses a component of NREI that Steve described um, on the Asilton Creek, and it produces um, some abundance and, and uh, viability information uh, that we have used to predict and show what is going to work in, um, as far as pushing these populations towards recovery. It essentially just, um, suggested that adding wood in this watershed is not going to um, produce a positive result in the near future. It did suggest, though, that if we um, reduce stream temperatures by, for example, adding shade, that that is going to have the biggest potential for response in, in restoring fish populations. And just a plan view of a couple of the predictions that uh, were run through in the model. These are, this is fish distribution. Blue is good for fish, red is not. Current conditions, if there was a 10% vegeta vegetation restoration in, in the watershed, you don't see much of a fish response uh, if you have modest vegetation um, restoration. But if you restored it towards historic conditions, you would have a, a much bigger fish response, basically reducing temperatures by two degrees C in the watershed. So to conclude, um, obviously freshwater habitat is limiting production in the watershed. Um, we couldn't detect a, a watershed scale fish response in the watershed, but again, I don't view that as being negative. Um, we have emphasized that limiting factors to the fish are both flow and temperature, and then um, the models have really taught us some important lessons in um, examining both habitat complexity and um, focusing on temperature as, as the limiting factor. And then finally, some lessons learned. Um, the models have provided some convincing evidence. It's, it really um, emphasizes the importance of using some of these modeling approaches to uh, predict the future, especially when you don't have a lot of empirical, um, a lot of money to uh, force more empirical evidence collection. Clearly, um, solar insulation is a major influence on the water temperature in this watershed, and so shade is, in, is very important, but it's also very slow to develop. So um, you're not going to see a big response just by growing some trees in the next, you know, within a, a 10 year cycle, for example, that has been the life of this, of this uh, IMW. Um, there's other factors out there limiting our, the vegetation response. And then finally, um, we, um, with some of the groundwater work that has been done in, in the basin, um, John Selker and others would like to emphasize that you have to think very big if you're going to um, want to influence groundwater control of some of these watersheds. Not only looking at um, near bank water storage that is only going to last for a week or a month, you know, extend your, your cold water season, but you have to think watershed scale wide to uh, determine whether or not you're going to get some cold water influence to the watershed. And since I'm a minute over, um, I'll stop there.